six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at two thirteen. Good morning, everybody. Conley here with the Science Nights in the morning. We have a few nights assembled this morning. We have Dr. Thomas Schiller. We have Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee in the house. And we have a very special guest. I'm really excited for this episode because we have Amy Oxenham here, brewmaster extraordinaire. And I'm really excited to get into the science of beer. Now, before we uh, get into the show, I do want to... uh, let folks know that this show is dedicated to someone very special that we lost recently, Harry from Harry's Tanaha. And um, I think uh, Thomas and Honorbon have a real quick fond memory kind of uh, expressing how Science Nights even got conceived. What What is that? Yeah. So um, actually, the story goes back even before I was here. Yeah. So the idea was uh, – so Sean and uh, – uh, I used to hang out along with Crystal, but most of the time it was just Sean and I hanging out in Harry's Tanaha. And then we used to talk about sciences, and he used to talk about biology, and I used to talk about astronomy and physics. So it's just explaining stuff to each other. And uh, and an idea came about, hey, this is happening in Tanaha, and we are talking about science over uh, beers and stuff, so why just not? make a podcast out of it and then slowly the idea never went away and then thomas came in uh five six months later because he's joined sul ross <laughs> he wasn't there then so he's joined sul ross so some we get thomas into the idea of having uh this podcast and then um and then there then we found out about conley so and then and there it is so all Harry conceived in, in Harry's, Harry's. Naha. Yes, all conceived in Harry's Tanaha. Awesome. And then so, bringing it back to the uh, thing. And um, Amy is the brewmaster. You didn't mention of where, of what? Brick Vault. Uh, Brick Vault. Yes, I am the head brewer at the Brick Vault Brewery and Barbecue in beautiful downtown Marathon, Texas. And I love that area because, uh, I mean, they have awesome barbecue. I mean, yeah. when, when, when our viewers, because we have viewers from all across the globe. We have people from the Netherlands, uh, or viewers. Yeah, well, they're viewing with their ears, right, Anurban? Uh But no, yeah, listeners uh, from all across the globe. Uh, we have a few um, from India and, and the Netherlands. And all of them, when they think Texas, they think barbecue. And then... What goes better with barbecue than a good, nice, cold, like just hopsy kind of brew that'll just completely stimulate your different taste buds? So go ahead and uh, tell us a little about yourself and uh, why you got into brewing. Uh, Yeah, my name is Amy Oxenham. Um, I'm the brewer for the Brick Vault. And I guess I started brewing um, actually in Alpine. So I was mentored by Steve Anderson who was the founding brewer for Big Ben Brewing Company. Um, I brewed for them for a few years. I also completed a certificate in brewing science with the Siebel Institute of Technology in Chicago. That's America's oldest brewing school. That was also Steve's alma mater. Um, I also completed a biology degree with Saul Ross, which is how I know some of these fine folks. Um, And right now I'm currently working on a master's degree in brewing science and operations with Auburn University. Um, so it was a rather circuitous route. I definitely had years of hands-on experience before I had that academic experience. And I'm incredibly grateful that that's the way that it went by, by the time I sat in a classroom, I was already familiar with, you know, observing certain phenomena or, you know, already practicing. Um, so yeah, it's been a crazy ride and I love it. I, I couldn't think of a better career. And the fact that I get to do it out here is just even better. So yeah, that's really cool because I mean, you love science and like we all love beer, right? Yep. In and fact, science. Let's go ahead and take a <laughs> toast to here. Yeah, yeah cheers. Some delicious a toast. Cheers. cheers. We are recording this cheers. at a later time. This is not happening at 10 a.m. Yeah, in the morning. This isn't a- Still. 
more like to eat him. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, uh, Amy, if I remember correctly, this is even like you knew me as a faculty. I was there at the Big Bend, uh, the brewing thing, and, uh, um, and you used to give the those uh, tours, right? Yes, to I used to. And you used to have your uh, eldest uh, kid with you while g giving the talk. That was amazing to me that you're handling the kid along while giving the tour, like she was giving the tours to us. It was really really uh, kind of fun and she was really knowledgeable and like when we wanted somebody to talk about the science of brewing because uh, uh, beer uh, as a whole is it's kind of has very science component of science we thought like Amy would be the best person to have or oh, have our guest oh yeah for yeah sure. I had forgotten about that but yeah. th and that was before even finishing a biology degree. Yes, yes, so yes, yeah. Just sort of having that passion for fermentation and being obsessive about that food practice in general, um, I think kind of made me a good mentee for yeah. Steve at the time. Um, so he totally took me under his wing and showed me everything. And yeah, it was it was a great experience. So That's awesome because, uh, you know, Richard Feynman, the great physicist, uh, always said, uh, all life is fermentation. Mm -hmm. And you can find a universe in a glass of wine or beer. Absolutely and, uh, true. And yeah. fermentation is the one food practice that across the globe, regardless of, of geography and uh, time, all people have arrived at this process. And part of that is because it, it happens spontaneously and it happens naturally. Um, but fermented food products are some of the most important food products that, that hold the most sort of cultural significance. Um, and I guess kind of that's a pun because they're literally <laughs> cult beer, culturally significant. <laughs> beer goes back like 7,000 years, right? It's more. Yeah, there's, there's evidence beyond like the Neolithic mm -hmm. time for robust beer and fermentation practices. It would have been a very different animal, like drinking beer in the Stone Age. But um, yeah, it probably would have been more like a slurry, chunky, yeah. wild, sour Oatmeal, sort of experience. Yeah, yeah but... <laughs> I've always wondered that whenever, whenever I... Beer and chocolate and coffee. All fermented. Yeah, those are all three things yeah. where I always wonder who was the first person who thought, okay, I'm, I've got this rotten slurry of stuff I'm going to try to drink it and see what happens. Yeah. Um, obviously, after drinking it, they probably discovered this is kind of good. Pretty awesome. Um, yeah, and it would it would purify water too. So absolutely, there's a big sort of cultural importance in that sense. And yeah, and also like we also have to remember the Scandinavian people. They took out this piece of fish and they thought, how can we eat this fish? Up uh, fish. Mm -hmm. It's a fresh fish. So let us first r ferment this fish in a vat of lye and then make. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I can understand that, beer, but that's a little That fermentation fit. process, yeah. too, actually makes nutrients more bioavailable. There are even some food products that are even lightly toxic before they're fermented. Oh. The fact that we have all arrived at fermentation as a cultural practice is so fascinating to me. And the world of fermented foods is, is just incredible. It's, it's an incredible exploration. And I do feel honored to be a part of this. Like I tell my daughters all the time, like your mom practices the world's oldest profession uh, because I do be feel, <laughs> I'm hoping that. It's debatable to see what that is. I do feel honored to be a part of this human tradition that stretches before we even had written language. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're talking like, more than 10,000 years like of, of practicing uh, beer and fermentation. So oh, it yeah, does it sure. does have this sort of awesome sort of feeling of like standing hand in hand with practitioners of. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. That's awesome. And how many people do you think had to die before <laughs> we got to where we're at? Like, because that's part of evolution, right? I, like, th I think sure. much Fewer people died after beer was invented, I want to say. That's true. Okay, so here's something fascinating about okay. beer, too, is that pathogens don't actually live in beer because what's happening in beer is you have this huge colony of yeast, and now we're, like, hand-selecting that those 
exact species of yeast, but before it would have been a colony of bacteria and yeast, for instance, right? And it's sort of patrolling its own environment in a way, and it's safeguarding it against human pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, stuff like that. And so when you had water that was literally unsafe, most likely because of contaminants like E. coli, E. coli can't mm. thrive in that same environment. Like that yeast is is taking care of, as far as cleaning that up. You know, um, we get most of our modern antibiotics, for instance, derived from yeast as well. You know, mm. they're incredibly powerful. And yeah, they made things a lot safer to yeah. drink for a long time. You know, men, women, children drank beer for the majority of history. So anytime you reflect on, you know, a moment in history, just remember, like, you know, they were probably a little bit buzzed when they did yeah. things like wrote the Constitution or <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm all sure. that. <laughs> it, it really is kind of part of our culture. Yeah. And I, I know specifically um, my people, being a Schiller, have a rich history in in, in The Jews? German. German. Well, German. Oh, German. Okay. Yeah. All right. P- possibly Jewish. But um, uh, my family actually came from Germania to uh, what's now Czech Republic, to Bohemia, okay. which is like – the nexus of modern beer. Absolutely. Basically. Yeah. Um, so all the, the delicious yellow beery beers that you drink originated in that region, basically. Oh, mm-hmm. um, so and I, I'm, plenty of my family members enjoy beer, including me. Really? Some, some a little more than others. So before we get into the science of brewing and all those things, and uh, let, let's first, I, I want to get to the starting point of beer, right? Like, and uh, so The first thing in the history is like, I, in my naive mind, I would assume beer and wine, right, would have started out as the same kind of like, because beer comes from barley and all those, and the wine comes from fermented uh, grape juice, like fruit juice, right? So I'm assuming um, those two kind of had a hand in hand in evolution, like of that, or just is, or has it been proven? My question: Beer came first, wine came second, or something like that. Right. There was beyond that. Even there was sort of a bread and beer mm-hmm. debate as far as like what helped human beings step into like an agricultural lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And more and more people are postulating that it's actually beer because bread beer came before bread, maybe. Yes. Because bread does not happen spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. beer could, if you have a grain water and wild yeast, you have beer. And so that could presumably happen spontaneously. Mm-hmm. And and there are theories that that is what actually moved us into an agricultural lifestyle. So beer is literally the cornerstone of civilization. Yeah, that, that's what I would figure, like beer and on the on other side, because like, for example, India and China doesn't really have a whole lot of beer, but they had the wine thing going on. So I would assume like those cultures came along as like, oh, we have this rice and we have confirm if you ferment rice with water sake. you get sake and the and, and if you take for uh, like have a grape juice and if you let it, let it stay uh, over then it becomes a little bit uh, has an alcohol and uh, and one people one of the things is very interesting to note I, I don't know how is this common here in the united states or in western world is like uh, bears are known to get drunk yeah yeah, yeah. so like, there are yeah. definite animals that yeah. have like sort of alcohol seeking behavior yeah, yeah. bears are absolutely the, yeah in the trees. birds yeah bears, and, like yeah. in trees in, in, in <laughs> india uh, there are certain places in india there's a trees tree goes and it has a uh, uh it's called mahua and the fruits and everything carry a high alcohol or opiate content or something like that and the bear seeks that tree out gets kind of like high on that and passes out so it's very well known behavior for bears. Is that why they hibernate? Like for no, 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 no. This is totally <laughs> different. Just, like wasted, like <laughs> they wasted. They just, like, yeah. You know. So I think that has also. Th- I bet the human beings have come across animals getting wasted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, there has been a couple of times where I've read in the news that like there's sort of an epidemic of maybe birds who are getting- wasted and releasing havoc on like running into traffic and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, so, geez. I mean, like a lot of animals have evolved to you know, have receptors in their brain to have these sort of experiences Mm -hmm. with substances, Substances. you know? (laughs) So what was the first definitive evidence, do you think, was that 
in uh, history that we have the mention of beer. The yeah, first. that's a moving target. Even in the time that I've been brewing, um, I mean, that has moved further and further and further back. Like, we're literally talking, like, the the Neolithic age of we wow. were able to, we're, we've been finding evidence of, of brewing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's so, like a, like Sumerian recipes. Yes, right? exactly. Going all the way back to Sumeria. Some of the oldest recipes. Some oh, of the Robert's first. Locker, some of the yeah. first things that we even bothered to write down were beer recipes and how to govern beer. Yeah. It's it really has been so integral to how society and culture has developed. Um, beer even used to be like a way of of taxation too, um, in like Sumeria and. Uh, Egypt and all over the world, you know, because it was how everyone had to consume beer. And so what better way to tax people than, you know, get your hands in the beer. That's still in practice today. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, uh, we're still being taxed at every... (laughs) (laughs) From every direction. But that's okay. Now, uh, a question I have, we have about four minutes left before our first break. Um, Has beer always been as strong as it is now today or have we like are we building our tolerance because because i know people that are avid you know drinkers it takes a little bit more for them to get the same effect right they build a tolerance and i'm wondering evolutionary wise like if we like way back when we first started to start brewing this if chemically wise it was the same type of consistency that it would be now is it stronger is it weaker like what, yeah, if, what if we had a time machine went back in time and got one of the first beers sure well it would have been chunky <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have been sour you were relying on like wild microorganisms as well um but uh in in relation to your question it definitely would have been lighter we would have been talking between like two and three percent ABV, and mm. I think that we're there is actually a return to that trend mm. of intentionally producing lighter beers. Um, people are more interested in in drinking lighter beers. I've just seen that on the retail side of the different beer businesses that I've been involved in. Um, mm. It used to be one of the high, the biggest questions that I got um, at Big Bend was, uh, "What's your highest ABV?" And what's your lightest beer? And typically, they're not the same. But mm-hmm. now, I think people are looking for you know the smashable, uh, lower ABV beers, oh. which I think is great. Yeah, we're returning to yeah. beer flavored mm-hmm. beer. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm here for it. <laughs> well, that, well, that's that's cool. That's cool, and that's very interesting too because it makes me think that some where where this invention really or this discovery that we you know came upon Mm -hmm. uh the creation of beer uh affects different people from that region differently because you know a beer that you get from like germany would probably be different than beer you get from ireland right yeah definitely a a two liter beer that you get in germany you're probably going to uh, it's probably clocking in under 4% ABV. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they have in those giant, huge yeah. boots. Yeah. <laughs> the boots. Yeah, yeah. The boot that you got to turn the thing in the end. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, I, I believe in Czech Republic, they drink more, consume more beer than actual water. So people in the streets will walk around with big yeah. things of beer instead of, and you've been, you've been to yeah, Czech Republic. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you can attest yeah, to that. Yeah. I've seen like, kids in like high, after high school like graduation kind of thing that's the ritual like they will go out to spend night like just drink and which is very strange when i was there it was not rowdy it was just like kids just sitting in playground at like nighttime eight nine o'clock just chilling out drinking beer it's mostly because uh the drinking part of it's not like said oh so they are doing a bad thing or looked down upon or something like they're not like there was barely like if you less noise than kids in a playground. It's like just a, they're relaxed and they're having fun because something major has been achieved. So just drinking beer and and these are like I mean yeah I'm think they're seventeen eighteen I'm saying they're kids but but in my mind they're kids. So, oh yeah. sure, and that kind of yeah. speaks to like yeah. culturally what we put on yeah. alcohol, alcohol in general. And, yeah. yeah. One thing I was going to say the difference is like I've had this mentioned many times and you will know this better that European beers or uh, UK beers are typically AB, uh, the alcohol percentage is lower 
compared yes. to American beer, which is, uh, I did not know that, which is very mm -hmm. strange to hear. Uh, people, uh, British people, and they're like, the beers here are strong. They're, it's not that you can just chug them like in uh, Europe and something. You can just chug a beer and you drink beer just like normally. Well, I was, I was yeah. telling Amy before we started recording, um, when I lived in Lubbock, they had a great selection of, of what I call fancy beers. And um, there are certain styles that are just insane. I think at a certain point, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna sell it, you have to start calling it like a barley wine or something right. once you reach a certain ABV. If you get above thirteen percent, you get into a different tax arena. Okay, yeah. so they have to call it something else. But man, I had some like bourbon barrel aged beers that would hit me like drinking straight <laughs> bourbon. Yeah, they're good delicious. Night. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, okay. uh, we're about to go into a our first commercial break, but after the break, I would like to uh, talk about where it all started. It starts with the seed, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and then it also starts with uh, growth. We're right? going to go through all the steps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's going to be wait. great. It's going to be great. <laughs> we'll see you right after the break. Cheers. All right, we're back. We're the Science Knights, and uh, if you give me a second, I'm going to take a quick swig off this delicious beer. Hmm. We're here with Amy Oxenham from Brick Vault Brewing, and uh, we're sampling one of her delicious brews. Um, what's what's this one called? Does it have a name? This one's called Blue Quail Pale Ale. Blue Quail Pale yeah, Ale. Yeah, I it always like delicious. to give a nod to the local things going on. So <laughs> yeah, Blue Quail Pale Ale. Um, Y'all have it at Brick Vault right now. On we do. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so go go check it out because it is it is delicious. Um, so my question is, as we sip this delicious beverage. Um, where do you start making something so pure and, and glorious? Like general process of starting. The process of starting, starting. it from yeah. seed to, to stein. Yeah, so that process actually starts before it even gets to me. So barley is an incredible grain. It's been chosen as sort of the default, not chosen really, it's sort of proven itself over time as the default brewing grain. And that's because of the enzyme content. So... It has all these great sugars, um, but it also has the enzymes that are able to cleave those sugars into smaller sugars um, to actually be digestible by yeast. And that actually starts with the malting process, which is its own uh, art form. Absolutely. There are... And briefly, what is the malting process? like? Sure. Yeah. Malting is a, another fermentation process, um, but pretty much it's tricking the barley seed. Once you've harvested the barley seed, you're going to trick it into germinating. And um, the different layers within that seed are going to start producing enzymes, essentially to begin digesting those carbohydrates and starches inside of that seed. Um, that should be used for fuel to grow a plant, but the maltsters will actually stop that process and then they'll go on to roast and kiln the malts to varying degrees. Um, and then that's when I get the malt. So, yeah. So, well, um, real quick. Uh, so, when we're talking about the seed, right? Uh, we have an episode all about GMOs, right? Uh, is this seed like basically, do we get the chance to? find the perfect seed that has evolved throughout the years. This is the crazy thing is that we've actively been, you know, selecting for preferred grasses, if you will, uh -huh. for so long that barley mm -hmm. is not GMO. We don't even need to, oh, really? we don't even need to get in there and mess with the genes anymore because it's been so selected for. This is a process that is thousands of years old. There's more research and money that has been pumped into beer research, essentially, mm -hmm. than I, I would... I mean, that is basically GMO done the old style. The old basically. way, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tens of thousands of years. Yes. So this <laughs> essentially is a gift from God, right? Literally. Like, I mean, God and Harry and all of our friends up there that we've lost <laughs> yes. in the past are toasting to us down here because it's all part of the, the whole scheme. It That's really great. is quite incredible how perfectly built barley is for brewing. Um, yeah. So I actually brought some samples of right. different Sweet. barleys because I think that beer, like anything, if you when you taste the components of it, the ingredients of it, you can develop like a better appreciation for what's going on there. Um, so we're going to start with like some light ones. And I totally encourage you guys to taste it. 
Yeah. Oh, take, we, oh, for the yes, listeners here, we've, we've got a whole portfolio of, of different barleys that are of different Be, Before different I shades even uh, taste it or something, the question that I had in mind, like this barley that I'm holding, the, the different barleys you have, right, that I'm holding, that you're past showing us, is like, I can, this barley, I can eat it too, right? Oh, oh yeah, barley. absolutely, that, yeah. So there's no distinction at all, like the barley. Well, it's a you, cereal, it's like a grain. Yes, yeah, it's yeah, a cereal exactly. grain, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, because like some people, uh, like you have certain varieties that you don't eat and certain varieties you eat. I was just wondering, right. like uh, like you have foods like that, the, right? So, the yeah. barley that's going to yeah. make it into a brewer's hand is food-grade barley. There is feed-grade barley, but mm. typically that's based on the kernel size. Mm. So brewers want nice, plump grains with the large endo sperm that's going to make a lot of starches and thus sugars available um so this has already been selected for food grade um and i brought a bunch of different varieties because i think that it's interesting to not only taste but to like visualize the different degrees of of like this is roasting very strange because i never knew on. you could just eat barley like this yeah. it, is like, <laughs> it is very interesting it's, very, it's incredibly nutritious too yeah, yeah. Granola bar or something yeah, it, it really is, and it, it's very nutty. It has a very earthy flavor. Well, that first one we tried was a was an IPA or what? You the first one was ale? a pale ale malt. So that that barley that we first tried would be the base grain for this beer that we're drinking as well. So as you can see, it results in a, a nice light golden color. Um, we've moved on to honey malt. That one has been kilned to a greater degree, so it has a kind of tanginess almost, I would say. And then this the, one will taste the next like one, chocolate. Yeah, the next one that we're trying is actually chocolate malt. So that one has mm. been kilned to a much greater degree. Um, and a lot of chocolate malts are even like drum roasted. So it's very, very, very similar to the coffee roasting process. We have, if we want to dig into the science of that a little bit, you have the Maillard reaction that's taken place and contributing a lot of flavors. Um, what is Maillard reaction for? So what yeah, so the Maillard reaction is, um, it's the same exact reaction that happens when you like grill a steak. So it's, there's a little bit of caramelization of sugars happening there, but there's also a lot of proteins that are being changed by the heat reaction. Mm -hmm. So proteins are being sort of unfolded and denatured through that heating process, um, but it's also giving you some very roasty notes and flavors. Mm. Wow. And they're yeah. so different. They're very different, yeah. How are they molecularly? Are they similar? So... Something that's been roasted longer is going to have a lot less um, even to no uh, enzymatic potential left in it mm -hmm. because enzymes are proteins. And so the more something is exposed to heat, the less enzyme potential it has. Mm -hmm. So uh, something like that, like the chocolate malt, I'm going to use a very small percentage. So I'm still going to it's it's a lot like making bread um, is what I compare it to. You're going to have like a base sort of flour or barley in this case that you're going to use. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come in with the different um, grains or different malts that have been roasted to varying degrees. So that chocolate malt, for instance, I would only use, you know, five to 10% of the entire grain bill of that particular malt. Wow. So, yeah. And then I'm, I'm relying, I'm sort of piggybacking on the, the very active enzymes in that base malt to do the heavy lifting as far as like the conversion that's happening in the actual brew house. So. so they all, there's a waltz here. Like uh, everything has to kind of, it's beautiful. It's a delicate <laughs> kind of waltz. And I love it. Everything has to beautifully work in concert with each other. It's amazing. In order to give you yeah. the ability to ask uh, that person out or, or, like, <laughs> right? or, or the ability to uh, Absolutely. You know, go up there and sing the best karaoke, karaoke baby. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to um, start asking very straight for like very stupid questions. Lay it can, on me. <laughs> can you mix two uh, strains of barley? Like you made a, uh, you gave us like honey one yeah. and the plain one the, for the pale ale and stuff. Can you mix them up? Yes. And that's a great segue on yeah. um, Iran because you can actually mix up different types of grains. So I brought with me some other brewing grains. So okay. you're still relying on that that base malt. So this is it's labeled as wheat. This is wheat. So if you notice the very first difference, wheat is actually a naked grain. So um, there is no husk mm -hmm. on the outside of this grain. Mm -hmm. And this, um, I'll use 
I typically don't use more than 50% um, in any particular brew. Um, so I'll, I'll still be relying on that, that barley enzymatic power, um, but then I'll be mixing wheat in um, for flavor, head retention. I mean, like we've all had wheat beers. They're markedly different from mm -hmm. all barley beers. So it's contributing a lot flavor wise as well. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely mix all sorts of grains. And I'm assuming there are also people who are using different strains of wheat, just like different types of Absolutely, barley. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there's a big push to kind of bring back some like historical, uh, you know, grains that maybe have been forgotten along the way. So old styles of, of wheats. Typically what you see with those older styles is they have a higher protein content. And typically for protein to increase, um, carbohydrates or sugar potential decreases, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we've moved away from those grains um, because they're harder to ferment. But now with such well-modified barley, um, you can be mixing those grains in and still be getting the same results or great results from... So we have barley and uh, and wheat now. So what about uh, things like um, the grains like millet or, uh, yep. or corn and stuff like that? Millet, corn, yeah. sorghum. Sorghum is actually the the biggest grain that is used, like production wise, uh, in the entire continent of Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. Their beer production. They're actually um, some of the only countries that don't uh, rely on barley. They're mm -hmm. using sorghum, which includes a whole other host of, uh, you know, procedures as far as like adding different types of fungal derived mm. enzymes and stuff. Um, yeah, it's really enzymes, man. <laughs> yeah. so, so beer can really be, it's not necessarily just, just barley, water and hops. It can be, no. so yeah. it, it, for, for all the different varieties of beer, uh, whether it be a, a rye or barley <laughs> is the common denominator hops. Because I mean, you 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 make that's you make bourbon question. with corn. You make yeah. rye whiskey with rye. Um, I understand that that's distilled, but right. do you start out with like the, you still the mash? start out with a mash? And distillers actually call it beer too okay. before okay. it becomes distilled. Um, it's the exact same process. Um, you know, I think what the common denominator of like what is beer is a cereal grain that okay. has been fermented. Um, and I think that it's interesting how different cultures have approached um, activating that enzyme activity, right? So if you have um, like sake, for instance, is made from rice, but then they also use fungal enzymes to ferment that rice because that rice is not the complete package as far as the enzymatic profile goes because they're full of carbohydrates, they're full of starches, but starches, yeast is a, a single cellular organism, right? It's in the, it's in the fungus family or kingdom. Um, and so it literally needs like smaller molecules to actually be transported into the interior of that cell. So if you can't cleave those starches apart into smaller sugars, then they can't actually go through fermentation. They're non-fermentable. And so corn or rice rather like in sake, uh, for example, is being fermented with other outside fungal enzymes. Um, there's a really lovely example of a, a South and Central American beverage called chicha, which is actually chewed by people Absolutely. and then spit. I and I love that people can chew and spit into a common vessel and then fermentation makes that an essentially like sterile product for people to wow. drink. Like yeah. that's incredible to me. So. In that case, they're relying on the enzymes in your saliva, saliva. to start cleaving those starches apart into Digesting. smaller yeah. sugars. Yeah. yeah, that is crazy. It's really crazy. And so that's what, when I get the malt in the brewery, um, I'll create a mash out of it. And essentially it's just a porridge. But my entire goal during that mashing process is to make sure that I'm within scope for certain um enzyme temperatures because enzymes are proteins and they can be denatured or unfolded through heating. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll, I'll leave the mash at certain temperatures where, you know, like proteases, for example, are more active and then I'll raise it to where amylases are more active or gluconases and so on 
based on what type of beer I'm making. So if I want more non-fermentable sugars, I'll mash in in a certain way. And then I'll end up with a beer that has, you can actually feel that sugar in your mouth at the end of it. Like dark beers, they're literally thicker. Um, and that's because that brewer has taken care to not turn all of those sugars into fermentable sugars. Mm. So they're leaving some carbohydrates in the wort is what we call it it's the sugar water that we get out of brewing it's w-o-r-t um and so they're taking care to make sure that those carbohydrates are left in that wort um right yeah yeah yeah, so it's a lot of chemistry there's it's a lot of chemistry i could talk forever about this i I love this stuff like, like you're blowing my mind just thinking like you're bringing new definitions to things. I'm thinking differently about you know, I appreciate your is. beer a lot more. When you're yeah, drinking. definitely. And I think that it's really cool that we actually haven't been able to like see any of this happening. So this is like a prehistoric process in a lot of yeah. ways. It's largely unchanged for how we've been doing it for at least a few thousand years. Yeah. And if you think about it, we've only even been able to visualize microbes for the last like less than 200 years. Yeah. So it was like literal magic to move most brewers yeah. throughout all history, you know, and I think that that's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, <laughs> and um, they they have mead, right? They they they, yeah. they have big thick. <laughs> I mean, it's so frothy. Flagons of mead. What, what is mead and beer similar? Are they like related? Yeah, they're fermented. So okay. And again, it's the it's the enzymes in that bee saliva that is making those carbohydrates available for fermentation. So there's there's a, a lot of people who sort of postulate that maybe that's where things started, that mead was sort of, oh. you know, because you have bees, uh, you know, building their homes inside of logs, like hollow right. logs. So it would be probably pretty easy to come upon some fermented honey, you know. Mm. Uh, which smells amazing too. And I guess as hunters and gatherers, that's typically what we would have been relying on is like our sense of smell. So mead probably would have been a really delectable, uh, you know, prehistoric. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so we're, we're at the mash stage. Sure. Let's, okay. let's do we jump into hops now? Hop, hop, <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> we're almost to hops. So, okay. So, uh, I'll make a big mash, which is sort of the consistency of oatmeal. Um, I'm relying on all of those different enzymes doing all that work. That Just that part of it takes a few hours of my day. And then from there, I'll begin drawing off that sugar water that I've made. And that is called wort. Mm. Um, and it's just a very slow and delicate process. Um, I don't want to like jam it through. Uh, I've taken a lot of time to sort of create the sugar profile in there that I want um, and also beer that is rushed is, is cloudy beer. And I mean, you know, yeah. I work, <laughs> I work hard to make clear beer. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Mine's really clear. Yeah. Mine's so, it's yeah. almost like there's no beer left. <laughs> there's nothing that in there. And it is unfiltered. I just want to point that out. All of my beer is unfiltered. That wow. is just the, that is the, the product of my training and being trained by very classical brewers who are like. Don't put out hazy beer, make clear beer, make beer flavored beer. Um, so, so yeah, so now we've, we've moved over into the boiling kettle and we've collected all of our sweet wort um, and then we'll begin to boil it. And what's happening during that boiling process is, again, we're taking more steps to make clear beer. We're also taking more steps to um, sanitize that product mm. so i'm going to boil it for 90 minutes i do it a little longer than most brewers because we're at just high enough elevation mm -hmm. to like kind of start messing with the boiling process um so i'll boil for 90 minutes and what that's going to do is start to precipitate a lot of these proteins that are in solution at that time they're going to be like coagulating together and you can begin to see them too it almost looks like egg drop soup sort of material um and that also is going to create a clearer beer because i'm getting that protein that could be potential haze i'm getting it out of the beer um and then that's when we're going to add the hops so Hops are appreciated for two different qualities. One would be bitterness and the other would be aroma. Um, so I've brought two different examples of hops. Um, one is called Belma 
And these hops here that we have before us, they have been pelletized. So these are what we would call a T90 pellet. So it basically looks like rabbit food or something. It's been mm. pelletized in a very similar process. Um, so if you guys want to... What does hops look like um, naturally in the wild? Yeah, so they look like this. Oh, um, <laughs> oh, like I've got some earrings that have, yeah, hop flowers on them. Um, they're actually in uh, the same family as cannabis and hemp, so yeah. they have a very similar dank qualities. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, <laughs> cannabis and hemp. Big yeah. Time. So I was going to say... Do you want to smell? I would not recommend eating the hops, yeah. but go ahead I'm and give it a whiff. You, it. <laughs> you can if you want, but it's Maybe. they're very bitter. Yeah. Oh, I'm a bitter, bitter man. They say. Get after <laughs> it, man. People have been told <laughs> me. Peter, you know, they, <laughs> okay, I'm taking a nibble. It was like rabbit food. It's so not have, for the faint of heart. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, it's bitter. I don't like bitter. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that I would. Uh, I mean, at a vegan restaurant, I'd probably order it. And then these hops... You don't even eat anything other than the steak. You're not even going to go into a vegan restaurant, <laughs> Kali. So, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I need another... These next hops are Zappa hops. So, they're literally named after Frank Zappa. No, oh, nice. Um, his family has a relationship with a hop farm, um, and they made a variety after him. So I think that's pretty awesome. That first example, the Belma, those are more bitter hops. Mm -hmm. The Zappa are more aroma uh, hops. And I feel like you can sort of smell the difference. These are a little more... Those are kind of citrusy. Citrusy, yes. So um, my question is, so uh, you, we go from that... So we have first you create the mash, then you get the sugar water out of it, then you boil it. I'm really bringing making it very short, boil it. And as you're boiling, the protein is now coagulating. And then you're adding the hops at that point, And you've stopped boiling now, right? At that point, so are you still going to boil? Boiling and when I add the hops is another sort of tool in my toolkit as far as what's being contributed flavor or aroma wise. So if I want bitterness, I'm going to add it much sooner in the boil, uh, meaning that it's going to be boiled much longer. So I'm going to get I'm going to leach all of those bittering compounds out, those alpha acids in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I wait towards the very end of the boil or even sometimes after the boil, what we would call flame out, um, and I'm adding hops that I want the aroma mm -hmm. to last because those aroma compounds are incredibly volatile and I don't want them to be boiled away. So something that I want to do heavy lifting as far as aroma wise, I'm going to put in much later. Or, is that dry hopping is what that's called? Or I'm going to add it during fermentation. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're actually adding hops into the fermenter, as far as what we've talked about so far, we're just talking about hops in the boiling kettle. But hops actually going into the fermentation vessel, that's what you would call dry hopping. And now we have hops, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, if, if we go back like in the ancient history, did hops come around the same time? Did it, did it come later? Because it seems like... Do we need hops to ferment or can we do the fermentation process without yeah. hops? That is a fantastic question. Um, and th there's another, you're seeing another sort of trend that's happening as far as reaching back for historical styles. So we've only been using hops for the last 400 years or so. So okay. there's a very robust history of not using hops. Mm. In fact, when we were talking earlier about like different municipalities, like taxing people through beer, they actually used a gruit system. And so they would have sort of like a proprietary blend of, you know, a lot of times was secret, um, blend of herbs and spices <laughs> that they would distribute to any beer makers or ale makers. Um, and that is how they would determine like your tax responsibility because uh, it's correlated to how much beer you're producing. Mm -hmm. And so that like, if you can think of something, they've put it in beer, including yeah. a lot of really gross things <laughs> have gone into yeah. beer historically. Um, but Pretty much everything has gone into beer. Okay. So hop is not necessarily, when beer started, was a component of beer. It's, so it's relatively a, new. Yeah. Yes. So it's like four, three, 400 years, you said. So it's, it's relatively new and it took its time to spread and slowly. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. So I'm assuming nowadays, as you say, going back to the older beers, people are trying to get without hops right so you if you like nordic countries for example we're going back to those like heather and juniper mm. beer styles mm. um there's 
there's more people are digging in to see like what historical styles um, maybe have been around. Um, yeah, one of the more interesting beers I've ever tried was a, I think it was a Dogfish Head um, called King Midas. Yes, are you familiar with that? Yes, one? Yes, I am. And that, that one has grape and honey in it, I believe. But it's like an and ancient no recipe. Hops. No yeah. hops. And it was delicious. It tasted like beer, just a little kind of sweet and mm-hmm. and grapey. But and that they literally got out of a tomb. Like they found mm-hmm. that in vessels inside of a tomb and then analyzed it and made a recipe from it. See, that's freaking cool. So yeah, cool. cool. <laughs> there, there have been beer, uh, there's a, I think it's a Montana brewery. I can't remember what they called because this was years ago that they did it. But um, um, a dinosaur bone beer. They put dinosaur bone in it, <laughs> which yeah. contributes nothing. <laughs> to it. Yeah, that was, but it was so, in there. Yeah, but there, were, there was dinosaur bone in it. And uh, so... So now that you have added the hops, right, and the boiling process is now done, now the next step is coming in. Now we start the fermentation. Fermentation, baby. All right. <laughs> yeah. well, so, uh, so now that we are going to start the ferment- fermentation, we have to ferment ourselves a lot <laughs> to get ready. But no, seriously, I, we will uh, talk about the fermentation and the yeast and everything at that after we come back from the break. Uh, hello, everybody. So we are back and we are right now at the stage of fermenting the beer. So, Amy, now we have the beer uh, that uh, ready to go and we, have, we are adding the yeast to it now, right? That starts the fermentation process. Yes. Uh, this yeast, is it like the same yeast that I use for uh, making naan and all those kind of stuff? And, or is it a different variety of yeast for a different type of beers? And what, what? Sure. Yeah, there are uh, like variations of that yeast. But by and large, you're going to be using the same yeast for baking and winemaking and beer making. So that's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, same yeah. thing. I like the species name. Right? I mean, there's <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then the fermentation starts. Yes. And how long? So we're looking at anywhere from uh, four to seven days. That's just the very active fermentation. And so that is, the yeast is doing a couple things. The first thing is it's using all of the oxygen that's in the wort to actually reproduce. Um, So yeast reproduces through budding. It's um, buds off of a single cell. Um, And then it goes into metabolizing all of that sugar that you've made available for it. Um, and then the two byproducts of that metabolic action are CO2 and ethanol. Mm. So it's yeast, yeah. yeast waste byproducts that make beer so delightful. Um, That's so the, now, the fizzy bubbles and the, the alcohol. And the alcohol, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, now that we have the yeast and the fermentation is done, we have the CO2, ethanol, and whatever other stuff, the flavors and stuff. Is that beer now? It is technically beer, but it's going to smell a little different. It's going to taste a little different because at the seven-day mark, you still have what's commonly referred to as green beer. Okay. So there's some sort of bitterness that's contributed to, but from the yeast because it's still in suspension. Uh, that's not very pleasant. And so then the cellaring comes in, and that also takes a lot of finesse and time, um, mostly time. <laughs> uh, I'll have a couple of tools that I can use, um, including time and temperature and pressure that I can sort of nudge the yeast into behaving different ways. Um, but most of the time it's, you know, brewers like to say, we don't make beer, we make wort and then we turn it over to microbes and they do the rest. Mm -hmm. And so there is a little variation there. Um, you know, they definitely don't behave like I might want them to all the time, (laughs) but yeah. So you put it in a dark place for a prolonged period of time and you wait for it to... Yeah, and you're manipulating the the temperature throughout all of that because at a certain point, the yeast is surrounded by its own waste byproducts and, and so it's not very happy. And so I have sort of tricks that I can use as far as reinvigorating it. Um, so that might be like sending a bubble of CO2 through there to sort of rouse that colony of yeast and put it back in suspension. Or I can manipulate it through temperature where I can sort of wake it up by... By, um, increasing the temperature in there and of course all metabolic actions uh, you know happen a lot faster when the temperature increases um, so that'll sort of wake the yeast back up and then it'll even turn to some of its byproducts um, other things like uh, you know diacetyl and acetaldehyde and stuff like that and it'll actually begin metabolizing those waste byproducts into uh, 
something else that is wow. not so, so unpleasant. Do you routinely sample it and test it, or every day? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've, my, so a couple of years ago, my wife bought me a at home brewing kit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Those are great. Yeah, and, and I was so jazzed about doing it. And I had friends in, in Lubbock when I was a grad student who would brew, um, and I started reading the process. And it was all great up until that point. It's like, okay, you've done all this work. Now you have to wait, I don't know, how many weeks or months. Yeah. Depending oh, yeah. on the style of And you have to sell her. Yeah, you have to yeah. sell her it. And I was excited to make like Czech-style Pilsner, and that's even... That's the longest. That <laughs> takes the, longest. the most yeah. And you have to have finesse. a kegerator and all this stuff. Yeah. So it's like, a I'll very, just go buy some It's a very expensive store. hobby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a fun, fun hobby, but it can get quite expensive pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. And that kind of brings us a little bit like full circle, right? Like, so now we have these people that have mastered these crafts, just like you, right? You're, you're I'm, mastering. I'm working on getting you're, there. <laughs> well, I mean, even doctors, MDs, the best doctors in the world are still practicing. Sure. So you're still yeah. practicing your, your perfection. And, yeah. And so me, the, the, from what I've, I've learned here, it's like, it's a combination of science and art, which yeah. is really oh, cool. Oh yeah. Yes. It's a culinary art essentially, but with a lot of science involved, um, yeah. which you don't see in, in other disciplines. Yeah, so. you don't see those streams cross very often. Um, I like to say that it sort of checks all the boxes for me. It's creatively demanding. It's intellectually demanding. It's physically demanding. I'm lifting a lot of things all day long. I'm squatting all day oh, yeah. long, you know. Um, and I can't think of a lot of science jobs, especially, that sort of have all of those components. And so for me, I feel like it's just perfect. I love it. I don't sit down all day. I feel challenged to constantly be coming up with new recipes and new formulas for things. And then of course, just, uh, you know, being that observer and that documenter of these biological processes is, it's always cool. And you make people happy. Yeah, it is it's sort like of like a commonly, superpower. Yeah, what we're commonly <laughs> opening it up with is there's nothing, there's no greater institution in Texas than Texas barbecue. And beer is, yeah, is, yeah. So, oh, well, no, that's the great thing. And, and, and I'd like to finish out these last like five minutes or so we have with uh, your fond memories that you have, uh, especially with in Harry's Tanaha. So like when it, I moved here at like the end of 2008. And of course, Harry's was like a cornerstone of my social life um, as a younger person without children. Um, and, I remember being in there one night and uh, like talking with Harry all night and there were all these bikers in there and this huge biker fight broke out and there were like chairs and tables and like... Like you see in the movies? It was wild. <laughs> Harry jumped into the middle of it, kicked everybody's butt, like just beat men down, like with <laughs> chairs and shit. I was standing there shocked, just like... <gasps> and he's standing like after he's like kicked everybody out of his bar, which of course we've seen... Harry, everybody's seen Harry kick people out of the bar, but uh, he's standing there all puffed up and he just turns to me and grabs me up by the waist and kissed me on the mouth. <laughs> it was like, I got to beat these men up and then I got to kiss this woman. And that's like, yeah. That, that, that's how you define masculinity right there. It was you a moment. Like, like, like straight up out of a movie. Yeah, ger cool Germanness. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's that German, right? Yeah, he was a badass, man. He was definitely. He was definitely. I mean, yeah, we've def it's exactly like what he used to say is that everybody is welcome at least once. And that's what I loved about Harry is that he was sort of chivalrous to a degree. And if he felt that somebody was out of hand, he would just tell them to get out and not come back. And then they weren't allowed to come back. I've seen people try and come back or beg Harry to let them back to the bar. And he would not relent, you know. <laughs> that's good. And, hey, that's pride and discipline, right? Yeah, he's now. a great guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about you, Tom? So my earliest memories of Harry go all the way back to the early 2000s when he ran what was called the Edelweiss, which now the, is now the Century, um, a glorious German food restaurant and a microbrewery. Um, so I, I, I knew Harry going all the way back then, but um, more recently, coming back to Alpine as a professor... You know, Harry's Tanaha is, and hopefully will continue to be, I don't know what its future is, but um, it's always a good place for for us as professors to go and, and not see students, because you don't want to go get sloshed and have a bunch <laughs> of students watching sure. you act like a 
drunken degenerate. <laughs> so of course that that ultimately resulted in in the science nights being born, but um, just being a nice laid back place where we didn't have to worry about about you know being responsible. Um, but my, I think my story, and Amy was was worried about her story being a little bit too PG thirteen. <laughs> Mine's going to be rated R, um, and um, I know Harry wouldn't care if I told this Hell story. No. And, uh, but Harry was a porn star, <laughs> oh or at least from what he told me. Um, so on a couple of occasions, me and Sean and Honorbon got to hear some some really great stories about his early days back in Germany and and being an adult film star. Oh my god! <laughs> along with some great jokes. And euphemisms, um, I'll leave it up to everyone's imagination. But, uh, yeah, we had some good times there. We we closed the place a few times and yeah. just got yeah. to sit there and, and chat with Harry. Well, that's a good segue into my um, story because he taught me how to play cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering why he was so great at it. Yeah. I couldn't understand why he was so good at cornhole. <laughs> But he was out there and he Years was teaching me how uh, <laughs> to get it in there. Right there and, uh, <laughs> I mean, golly, I, you know, I think I learned a lot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from that one, you, you know, those few instances wherever uh, he, <laughs> he, he, he was, he was he a master, it, master at his craft. Every time. Every time he nailed it. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was amazed. And, and he was probably, like, real chill about it, too. It was like, yeah, whatever. It was like he wasn't even trying. It yeah. was just, like, part of, part of his being. Yeah. Okay, here, With a boom. Bud Light in one hand to balance yeah, it out. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah, no, we had a great time out there, and uh, uh, he taught me cornhole. So, um, Harry, we love you. Cheers, yeah. Harry. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> this is, cheers. This, uh, uh, even oh. even yeah, the spirit <laughs> of uh, the spirit, right? Well, that's a great way to uh, end off. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, we're going to see you next week with another great episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.